Wednesday morning here on KSJE, and you're listening to the Scott Micklin Morning Program. I'm on welcoming to our viewers, of course, who are watching us live on the KSJE Facebook page and YouTube channel. Thank you for being along, everybody. And also my guest here in the studio with me, Dr. Brad Scroggins, is here from San Juan Health Partners Pediatrics. Good morning once again. Hi, morning. Good to have you with us. We've been talking a little bit about um, some of the concerns you have about e-cigarettes in the first half mm -hmm. of the show, and now I wanted to ask you a bit about some other topics that are coming up. I mentioned the flu season before we took the break, and we are certainly in the midst still of a pretty active flu season, especially in New Mexico. Yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, and flu activity does seem to be pretty high, not only in New Mexico, but in our neighboring states. Um, one of the bright lights on that, um, on that horizon, so to speak, is that I think this is the best year for the flu vaccine that I can remember. Last that I heard was about 90% effective okay. at, uh, at covering the, the H1N1 strain. That's the primary... Um, uh, type of flu circulating right now, which is good because again, as we as we've talked about before on this program, is when the CDC and the other folks are are coming up with the flu vaccine, they're trying to predict what the relevant um, more I guess active strains are going to be in that following flu season. So this they've tried to ma they've matched it pretty well this year, is what you're saying? Right. Yeah. Yeah. They seem to have done a great job. This so if you got a flu shot, your your odds of I guess survi not surviving necessarily, but but surviving the flu in a better shape are, are better than in previous years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and getting a flu shot may not completely prevent you from getting the flu, but it at least gives your immune system that little bit of boost that it takes to recognize when wild type flu is how we'll refer to the flu that's just circulating out yeah. there. Um, it gives your immune system that much more of a chance of fighting it off quicker. Um, so instead of five to six days worth of high fevers, vomiting, diarrhea, headaches, sore throat, runny nose, uh, you know, it may shorten that duration or make those symptoms less severe. And I think for folks who've ever had, had the flu are pretty good proponents of getting the flu vaccine. Uh, you would think. <laughs> right? well, that's what I've heard, yeah. but maybe there's still some that aren't. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, wish, I wish I could say that were true. Um, okay. Uh, you, know, it, we, you know, I think all of us as doctors that, that um, take care of people who, who we are recommending get the flu shot, we, we do like to ask when they come down with flu-like symptoms, oh, did you have your flu shot this year? And I think overwhelmingly those that have not had the flu shot, th that's who we're finding getting sick this year. So that does support that evidence that 90% effective on that flu shot. Right. Yeah. And would you say, is it still too not too late to get a flu shot, Dr. Stroger? No, I, if, you're, if, you're, if you've been on the fence about it, there's two questions I always want to know if people are on the fence. Number one is, how effective is the flu shot going to be uh, for a given year? And number two, how bad is the season going to be? Um, I don't think we've had in the last five or six years at least a flu, a flu season that's mild, okay? Right. Um, and number two, with the, as effective as that flu shot is this year, I'd say, yeah, come and get it. We've got, we've got plenty left. Um, and, you know, most of the local pharmacies have plenty left, so by all means, go and get your flu shot. There's, there's two different types of flu that circulate. Type A and Type B are the primary. Uh, each of the flu shots contains Two, two type A and two type B. So while we're seeing H1N1 type flu right now, that doesn't mean here in two or three weeks we might not be something, seeing something different. And then just as the flu A season starts to diminish, we head into spring break, flu B starts to pick up, um, and you could be well covered against that also. And that's not until end of March, so we still yeah. have several more weeks, I guess is what you're saying, of, right. of prime flu season Absolutely. ahead of us. Oh, yeah. So that <clears throat> flu shot is still something to uh, to consider. Absolutely. And uh, and again, in New Mexico, I, I think I've seen reports that we've been particularly hard hard hit by the flu this this year. Maybe um, as compared to other places in the country, is that mm -hmm. what you're seeing at the hospital too? Um, I'm not seeing as many kids with. Um, with severe flu, but, I see. but, the, but those, the small fraction that we are seeing that's getting it do seem to be pretty sick this year. Gotcha. Yeah. And again, that could be um, pretty serious, right, for younger folks and older folks. Aren't mm -hmm. they the most at-risk um, populations? Right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, anyone that's immunosuppressed for any reason, so if you're taking long-term steroids, um, if you, you know, if you're somebody who can't get a vaccine for whatever reason, um, yeah, very young. So generally under the age of two, and then again over the age of 65. Those are those are some very high risk age groups. Um, now keep in mind, we we do have a treatment for flu. In fact, there's there's a new drug out this year that's a single dose that treats flu. Now it's still very expensive, a little bit hard to come by. Um, the old standby treatment has been oseltamivir or Tamiflu. Uh, and what I always try and tell people about Tamiflu is it's it's by no means a 
benign medicine. Um, you know, we'll see we'll see people get pretty severe hallucinations, bad dreams, some cases vomiting that's difficult to stop. Um, so I so I don't like to enter into Tamiflu lightly. Okay? Right. I like to save it for those higher risk populations uh, that we that we mentioned. Um, so by by all means, the the best thing to do is get your flu shot. That's going to be the best prophylaxis. And then um, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to Tamiflu and even flu tests, every year by the time flu B rolls around, we're out of both. So we so we really try to be good stewards of of the supply that we have now. Um, right. Yeah. But again, for the very young and very old, they, it, it, flu can really cause a problem for for them. We've seen even fatalities, right, because oh, yeah. of flu every every winter. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. And this H one N one strain that's circulating now is the one from two thousand and nine that, if you recall, killed you know young pregnant women in pretty high numbers. It killed um, it killed you know otherwise young healthy adult men primarily in Central and South America. But we had some of that here too. Right. So it's um, the problem is you just don't know. So the right. best course of action is get that flu shot. Does not discriminate in, in some cases. Not at all. Is what it seems to me. And and that's what's so maybe hard for some of us to understand how a relatively healthy looking younger person can come down with, with the flu and, and, and it'd be a fatal case. Right. Absolutely. Um, another, another sort of interesting historical um, account that I, I don't remember learning about in school at all and it surprises me because the influenza pandemic of 1918 they called it the Spanish flu but it turns out it probably came out of a, a military establishment in Kansas uh, killed 50 to 80 or excuse me 50 to 100 million people uh, and ended World War one um, and so there's a great book on that called the great influenza and it's I mean it's fascinating from a historical sp- perspective because it talks about um, medicine was really in its infancy, and we we didn't have anything to use to treat people at that time. Um, you know, people would get sick, and within 24 hours would be dead. Um, uh, that's around the time the Red Cross came out. L- large numbers of doctors working for the military, and then Red Cross nurses would go in to help with the pandemic and would be dead within 24 hours. Wow! So, I, and that was just a hundred years ago. Right. Yeah. And and it was worldwide. And I know even there's some stories in Farmington and in mm-hmm. this area of of deaths by what they called the Spanish flu back That's in those right. back in those days and yeah. and some even uh, uh, graveyards I think around town that are that are because of all those fatalities of that, that flu pandemic yeah that the book uh, the great influenza does also reference Silverton Colorado as being a place where they stationed um, sheriff's deputies in the entrances to the city to try and keep people out that would otherwise bring flu and it still made its way there wow. and killed over half the city's population at the time which was not high no but it's amazing to me because at a time when you didn't have air travel that's how we think of, of these diseases tra- uh, spreading across the world these days right. it was certainly a lot different situation but it still spread right and um, yeah so so it's not to be trifled with no please that, that is for sure other thing I want to ask you about this morning uh, dr. Scroggins is uh, is vaccines and we see a lot of stories about uh, parents bless them that um, have chosen for whatever reason not to have their children vaccinated and um, and then we see that causing other issues at schools mm-hmm. or theme parks or other places where other people gather and it it just kind of uh, causes lots of lots of issues doesn't it absolutely it does yeah we're we're starting to see diseases come back that we haven't seen really for 50 years Um, it seems like every day now i see a headline of a new pocket of um, uh, primarily large communities of people who don't vaccinate Right. Um, but yeah, we're seeing, I mean, measles cases just popped up in Texas and Harris County around Houston. Uh, that was the latest headline I saw. Um, but yeah, we've got, uh, and, me- and measles, um, really for some of these things we vaccinated against, measles is the is the little cousin. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm worried about measles. I, I don't want anybody to get it. Right. But there are certainly other diseases that we vaccinated against um, that we have kind of taken for granted. Um, I, I always try to ask people who are hesitant to vaccine or who have flat out refuse to vaccinate um, what the worry is, you know, why, why is it that you think that the wild type illness is less, um, is less of a problem than the perceived toxins that are in the vaccinations? Um, you know, and we give, you know, at our practice alone, we give thousands of vaccinations a year. I mean, the routine vaccination schedule starting when you're an infant is two, four, six, 12, 18, and 24 months to get all your you know routine childhood vaccines and you get another set for the school year at four years old right and you know the number of side effects we see from that is very very minimal um, I, I think I have every 
once in a great while we'll have a kid that has a febrile seizure. Um, as scary as they are, they're not usually a, of any significant consequence. They don't they don't cause any long lasting brain damage. They don't uh, they don't really cause any um, down downstream detrimental effects. In fact, lots of kids that get wild type. Uh, illnesses like flu will suffer from febrile seizures. So um, one or the other. Basically, if you're prone to them, they're going to happen. Okay. I see. Yeah. No matter what, I guess, <clears throat> right. that you do or don't do. Right. I suppose. Because they could just as easily have had a seizure from getting the flu. Right. Right. And so so with these pockets of children that, that, that aren't vaccinated, that maybe have measles, which is highly contagious, if I'm not Very mistaken, so. mm -hmm. um, what kind of risk does that pose to then other children, other adults in that in that area? I guess if they are vaccine, they're okay, or could they still have a problem? They could still get it. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any way to go and look at we talk about herd immunity when everybody's vaccinated. We don't have a great way right now to go and look and make sure everybody still has an antibodies from when they were vaccinated. Right now, the MMR vaccination happens at 12 months and then a repeat at four years. Uh, and we have that now as a combination vaccine that includes varicella or chicken pox. Um, but yeah, we don't know if immunity wanes. And in fact, it probably does. Uh, the number one vaccine where we've seen the immunity really wane um, and, and the move was made to cut those febrile seizures was moving from a whole cell pertussis vaccine to an acellular pertussis vaccine. And while it doesn't have the same side effect profile, the immunity also doesn't last as long. So every year in this community, at least once, we have a, a whooping cough or pertussis outbreak. Right. And, and again, that can be contagious as well oh big time. right mm -hmm. and yeah and so that person could be isolated i guess in in the hospital or wherever where they're getting treatment right for those types of types yeah. of things mm -hmm. and so as we see this i guess when you talk to pa parents um who come in and say they've chosen not to vaccinate their their child your question is to them what's your fear what's your concern right yeah yeah what 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 is the fear what's the reason for not wanting to get the vaccine sometimes people don't have a great reason sometimes right. it's it's something they read online um, we have, you know, I, I think there's a fear of the medical community in general. And certainly if, if you look historically, there, there, there are reasons to have those fears, I think. Um, so I don't want to totally um, discredit their fears. But I can tell you, you know, my own children were vaccinated on the routine vaccination schedule. I, I vaccinate kids every single day in our, in our office. Um, and you know, thankfully, we, there's diseases like, you know, haemophilus influenza is one that causes a, a bacterial infection of the little, um, it's called the epiglottis, it covers right. over the airway, and that can swell to the point of kids not being able to breathe. It's called epiglottitis. And thankfully, we haven't seen a case of epiglottitis um, it's been many, many years. Sure. Other than in unvaccinated populations. And certainly, I guess you can understand why parents would be overly concerned about exposing their new children, young, newborn children to some of these issues, even if mm -hmm. they're very unfounded worries, Right, I suppose. Right. And, and so are you usually pretty successful in getting them to change their mind or reconsider their, their <clears throat> decision? I mean, I guess it's, as a doctor, it's probably hard to know how, how hard to push right. and when to back off a little bit. And yeah, and, and how best to approach it. Yeah. Um, how deep seated are those beliefs? Have they had a personal experience where somebody had a, an adverse reaction to a vaccine? You know, I try, I try to get to the to the root of of the worry. Um, but what I can say is, in in places where I've seen ch large pockets of children who are un unvaccinated, I went to medical school in Northeast Missouri, and we had large Amish population there, and for the most part, they did not seek care. Um, uh, medical care in general, unless right. things were pretty significant. Um, so I have seen some of these vaccine preventable illnesses there in, in those children. And unfortunately, um, you know, the, the uh, potential risk for not vaccinating is, it, it's scary. I mean, kids uh, will get meningitis from, from bacteria as simple as strep that we have a good vaccination for. Um, and unfortunately with that one, you're blind, deaf, or dead after you've had um, even strep meningitis in a lot of cases. Wow. Yeah. Right. Do you think there'll be a time when maybe we can run a couple of tests to see if a patient, a child, will be susceptible to a to a bad reaction from a series of, of vaccines? Will we ever get to that point in time? Do you think? That's a really interesting question. Yeah, we're we're starting to see some some genopharmacologics genopharma where we're starting to see um, you know running, uh, looking at your genes and seeing how you're going to react to certain medications. Um, the latest one there's there's a, a company out of Utah that's doing tests to see which psychiatric medications patients will respond to 
the best. So I suppose it's possible. And then if we find, you know, large enough uh, percentages of, of components of vaccines, and you know, maybe the vaccine manufacturing process can be changed. But I, but I will say that, you know, like I said, thousands of vaccinations given in our office, and we just don't see side effects from it. I mean, we consider it very safe, and and the the, the potential for not vaccinating can be something that's uh, that be hard to live with. Right. Because they're so severe, so and so permanent in some right. cases, I suppose. Very if much you're talking so. about death, right? Um, one other thing you wanted to mention that I wanted to ask you about too, and I'm surprised to hear you tell this to me before we came on the air this morning, was the amount of parents who are deciding not to have their child get a vitamin K um, vaccination, which helps with blood clotting with newborn uh, babies, right? Right. Yeah. Very true. Um, so one of the one of the few vaccines that babies or it's not a vaccine, excuse me, one of the few injections that a child will get right after they're born. They get a hepatitis B vaccination as recommended and is the routine. Um, and, and that one's interesting because that's the only vaccine preventable illness that's gone up since we had a vaccine for it. Okay. Um, which is the reason for um, for vaccinating all newborns at the time of birth, uh, but the other is a vitamin K shot, and vitamin K is a is a critical piece of your ability to clot your blood. Um, so little babies have have very um, friable capillary beds. You know they they will they will. Uh, you know they they're susceptible to bleeds from a very young age. Right. Okay? Well, they're brand new. Yeah, they're they're brand new and they're right. very and they're fragile. Yeah. Okay. Um, increased blood flow to the gut once the baby starts feeding can make you at risk for bleeds in the GI tract. Um, the other big area is brain bleeds. You know, e even in seeming, little babies, in right? Little babies, yeah. even seemingly minor um, uh, bumps can be potential big problems for this. And the, the vitamin K shot's been out since 1961. I was just looking it up before we before we came on the okay. air here. Um, and that is older than me, everybody. <laughs> just wanted you to know that. <laughs> um, yeah, the vitamin K shot's been out since 1961, and it's cut the risk of those substantial bleeds from vitamin K deficiency, which is called hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. It's cut that by over five-fold. Wow. So it's been a significant medical advancement. Uh, since we've seen big pockets of parents not providing this or, or refusing this for their child, we have seen an increased number in, um, in bleeds. And, and unfortunately, some babies have died. Wow. Yeah. Because it's so severe, so problematic, right. I suppose. Right. And because I'm not, again, my medical information is really limited, but I know when, when, when bleeding star starts, it's very difficult maybe to stop it depending on where it is, right? right. Yeah, very difficult to stop. You think of a, a bleed that happens in the GI tract or one that happens in the brain, there's no way to put pressure on that. There's, right. there's no way to go in operatively and stop that bleed in, in a timely enough manner to make any difference. So yes, unfortunately those, those children can bleed. Now the biggest risk for this hemorrhagic disease of the newborn is from two to 24 weeks. So you, so you make this decision at day one of life or with really within a few hours of life and that could impact your baby up to you know, almost, you know, almost four months of age, a little over four months of age. Right. Yeah. And, and as we all know, I think, who've been around babies or dealt with babies or had babies, um, they bump into things. And, uh, and they can have right. slight little bumps that maybe be, could become fatal if, uh, yeah. if not dealt with, I suppose. Yeah, or, that's so right. that's what you're talking about. That's right. And so, again, it is one of those things where uh, parents need to be well-informed and uh, and really search out some of this stuff because I know um, we love social media, we love the internet, but it, just as much good information is out there. There's a lot of bad stuff too, and folks really need right. to do their homework. Please, uh, yes, and you know I, I I do sympathize with people that that have anecdotal stories where they say they got a vaccine and had a had a bad reaction to it. Um, I, I've not heard similar stories from vitamin K shots. I, I really don't see where that particular fear comes from. Um, but if there, but if there are anecdotal stories, then I am sorry for them. But they are definitely exceptions. Right. And yeah. really, when you look at the numbers, you have millions of people that are benefited by these things, and a small percentage, maybe that has a bad reaction right or a perceived bad reaction there that, you go. that's the other thing sometimes sometimes diseases and i'm always use autism as a good example a lot of the times autism you won't really see outward signs of it until children are at a developmental stage where they're not doing things that you would expect a child at that age to do um, looking back a lot of the times um, you know we, we've we've heard about mmr and varicella as being possible triggers for asthma at the or excuse me for autism at the age of 12 months and that came from some faulty research that was done in the UK. That doctor has now been censored, lost his license. Um, this 
pretty big, uh, pretty big stink a few years ago. Right. Um, but we use that one as an example. Now, as autism research has continued, we see that there were signs presenting much younger ages, as, as young as six to eight weeks, where babies didn't smile socially appropriately as we expected them to. They didn't make good eye contact with their mothers when they breastfed. Something seemed off from a very young age. And unfortunately, until we know a little bit more about autism's causes, um, there's going to be a, a lot of speculation about it. Um, I probably on a weekly basis, I see some new cause of autism show up in the research, whether it's Zofran or air pollution or um, the mercury or glyphosate, which is um, um, Roundup fertilizer, right. um, weed killer. Yeah, so we, there's a lot of speculation. And uh, rightly so. We need to figure out what's causing it. Sure. But we don't know. We don't know. At this and point. And it seems very clear that it's not vaccines. Right. Yeah. And, and again, um, people need to do their homework. And, or ask folks like you. I think when they come into the doctor's office, I mean, I think. Um, Please. If yeah. you're vaccinating your own children, I can't imagine that you would put them at risk. No, absolutely not. No, no. But I, I do. I, I treat every child as I would my own. Right. Yeah. Very good. Good information this morning, Dr. Scroggins. Thank you for coming in this morning. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate you being here. Dr. Brad Scroggins, my guest here from San Juan Health Partners Pediatrics on KSJE. Back with more in just a moment, everybody. Back in a minute.